Mladi returns here with champion Audi to defend his title. And of course, his teammate Derek Bell also returns. He hopes to take some strong podium finishes from the end of last season and take that momentum straight into 2002. Peter Cunningham is ready to battle for the GT Championship once again in his Acura NSX. GNW Motorsports drivers Johannes Van Overbeck and Justin Marks have upgraded to the new 2002 Porsche 911 Cup car. Ultimately, the differences that I feel are the differences that we've made in uh, you know the shock package and, and the overall suspension uh, package and uh, getting the tires to work a little bit better for us. And uh, but mechanically, the car feels the same. After a year off from the series to develop the Saline Mustang, Jung Young heads up a list of rookie title contenders that include Greg Merrill and Tim Weens, who will be piloting Porsches. Speaking of rookies, 1999 Rookie of the Year George Biscop returns after two seasons out of the saddle with this brand new machine, a brand new 2002 Porsche 911 Cup car, and with his experience, he certainly should be a factor. I would think so, and of course, the, this track, always a challenge. Derek, uh, take us around. And if you look at the number of corners, 16 before you get down to Sunset Bend, looks very difficult, very complicated. Rhythm is a major key here. Low, medium, and fast corners, long, fast, straight uh, with the Omen straight, and of course, turn one has got a multiple variety of lines. You can get yourself in trouble there. And here's a look at the field that'll be funneling into that first turn. Michael Lotti is 15th career pole. Peter Cunningham, they've been fighting a fuel management problem. That's your front row. Last year's pole sitter, Van Overbeck. And the very fast rookie, John Young, bad fast in practice. The Farmer, McMillan, McClure, Marks, and Bell and Miller round out the top five. George Biscop's back. He's in trouble. He's in trouble because they had a change of tire. Look down to the rest of the grid. Michael Culvert, for those of you who don't know, is the, one of the new owners of Skip Farber Racing School. Let's go back down to the grid. Jan Bikas. Michael Galati picks up where he left off last year, driving the champion Audi. Of course, he is the defending series champion, but not the defending champion of this race. Last year, just prior to the last lap, you had the thing in hand. And then right across the street here, Peter Cunningham pipped you at the post. Is this revenge time? Yeah, I mean, uh, this year, hopefully, it's going to be different results. I don't think I had a hand like a sound. It was a pretty good race. But I think if you were, Peter had me cover that race last time. He just was waiting for me. And but this year I think it's a little bit different. Is this a race with the heat today? You got to be careful with your tires. Yeah, the heat went out. So the heat of the day, it's pretty hot, and uh, we got to try to save everything. You know, it's going to be very important. Just try to stay up front if we can, and take care of the car. All right, have a great run. We talked about Peter Cunningham alongside on the front row. We're we'll going to have a quick chat with him. Now he has the advantage of having run only a couple of hours ago, hours ago in the touring car. And Peter, if I can have a quick word. Does it help you having just got out of the car a couple hours ago and having some track knowledge with the touring car? Actually, I think it does. I know a few places where it's slippery out there, and uh, I didn't necessarily mention it to any of my friends on the grid here. So, no, I, I think that uh, the track is pretty slippery, and we're going to do the best we can, but uh, we don't have four-wheel drive either, so we'll see. Some people say you're holding back, sandbagging a bit. You haven't shown everything. Uh, has this car got more than you've shown? Well... Uh, I'm not sure. We didn't have that many laps, but uh, it's a strong car, no question. And uh, we're going to have to pedal it pretty hard to keep up with that Audi. Well, he's a fast driver and a good politician. Have a great run. Well, PD constantly gets accused of sandbagging, and I'll tell you, I don't quite understand it. There's a good look at Derek Bell. Now, remember, the Audi team came here and tested about a month ago, so they've got some well-sorted cars, and we're going to be hearing a lot from Derek Bell as this race unfolds. Don't go anywhere. He's got a heck of a drive out of turn seven, and he has motored by Galati. But then he dips the brakes a little early and lets Mike Galati slide on through. Derek Bell will play teammate to perfection here, I think. This is by far, by far, the best run for Derek Bell. You know, Derek let you win the first race of Road Atlanta, right? Last year. <laughs> he, he, he let you repass him. <laughs> I love that. Lap. I love that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not. <laughs> it was, uh, no, Daddy play a uh, good teammate. I appreciate that. I mean, he just let me by, you know. But, uh, you know, we had to do another 20 laps after that, you know, so. And I didn't overtake him, that's what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> 
champion Audi comes off an impressive speed GT season, capped off by Michael Galati's title clinching performance at Road Atlanta. He and Derek Bell look for continued success this season. I hope we can be right up there, but you know, um, I don't think they're going to want Audi to win two years in a row, so I'm sure we're going to have to work for gain our laurels this year. Any words of wisdom from Derek? Well, for him, keep out of his way. <laughs>
Well, Speed Channel viewers, you saw that start that we all made there. Um, I hope you saw mine a little better than some of the others. Of course, as you know, we're in the Audi Quattro. And uh, I like these standing starts because they favor our sort of car. And you'll see on a restart now in the yellow that it doesn't work perhaps quite so well because we don't have that sort of power. However, when you're sitting on the grid, you just build up the revs in first gear and this car has such amazing sort of clutch grip, for the want of a better word, that when you let the clutch out in first gear, it just spins the wheels and you go straight away to second, as you'll probably see when I accelerate away. Then I start to get traction and I get up to third as quick as I can. We did some tests the other day and it gets naught to 60 mile an hour in 3.4 seconds. So it's pretty outstanding once he gets going. That is really what the standing start is about. And then of course trying to miss everybody. And I do always get up a row. In fact, in the case of this race, I got up two rows. So we can see the great advantage of Audi Quattro system at the start of a race. But it didn't do me any good because I got up there and they all hit each other. Anyway, that's racing. And uh, I hope you watch the next start, which of course will be a rolling start under the yellow. And you'll see it quite differently there because we have to build up a bit of pressure on the power by having, uh, having our left foot on the brakes to build up some boost. And then we release it when we get the green. But of course it isn't as immediate amount of power that you want as much as you get with a lovely V8 without any turbos. Over to you. Greg, driving number 13 didn't turn out to be too lucky today. What happened down here? Well, yeah, we had the, the standing start. Um, Johannes uh, was one of the front runners. He, he uh, bobbled a little bit at the beginning and... Uh, and then got going, and I, I was able to get up next to him, and uh, my teammate, Bob Miller, was, was next to me on the right. Um, Bob started pulling over. I, I had nowhere to go. It was a sandwich between me and uh, Van Overbeck, so I, I got bumped, and then I bumped into uh, Johannes, and, uh, and I guess you saw the rest probably better than I did. How are you feeling? Obviously, I can tell. Just You've got the adrenaline flowing right now, but your car didn't look too healthy. Now, I'll have to take, check out the car. I don't know what's going on with the car, but... Uh, no, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. Uh, it wasn't a hard hit for me. It's at the beginning of the race, we weren't going very fast, but uh, fast enough, I guess, to do pretty much damage to the car. I'm glad you're okay. Okay, thanks. Well, a squeeze play off the start for the standing start, and then another separate incident, another squeeze play down in turn one where you might expect it, and that has us under full course caution. To imagine what no one has ever... Welcome back to Sebring, everybody. The carnage has been cleared away. We're looking for the restart. Remember Derek Bell's great description of how they have to build up turbo pressure. It looks like Galati did a nice job of it. He's still got the pressure behind. That's McClure and then McMillan, the BMW. That's the top three. Galati will hang on. Petey Cunningham comes slicing through in fifth. And of course, the question's gonna be, what is the extent of the damage to Cunningham and Farmer's vehicle? I don't know, but Cunningham now look, has a look down the inside. Cunningham did a, a perfect 360 spin right in the middle of the pack in that first corner and didn't get clobbered by anybody. That was amazing. It was amazing. He just went by Daniel Eastman and picked up the four spot. So he's definitely, at least at this point, feeling fairly healthy. There's a good look at McMillan, champion a couple of years ago. Mr. Consistency and, of course, that beautiful BMW package. Here comes John Young, that new Celine Mustang, totally reworked, different paint scheme on it than we've ever seen. But I'll tell you, that thing makes a just prodigious Trans Am level horsepower. And it sounds great and looks great with all those uh, wings hanging off it and those uh, fender flares. Just looks the business. And, of course, that's, com that's completely legal because that's how the car comes in spec. And you can buy any of the aftermarket kits. Anybody who owns a Celine Mustang can do that. And he's coming after Eastman right now. On board with Derek Bell. Watch in front. You can see Eastman. Then you can see Young. Then Michael Culver right in front. The number 14 Porsche. Young still battling and gets by Eastman. So Young's picked up a spot. Then Eastman. Then Culver. Then our man Bell. Our man D. Bell in the middle of the mix here. Justin Marks right behind Bell. See him there, right side of our screen. You saw him well featured in some races last year. Derek Bell. Ooh. You Trying see, poke down the inside. That's a difficult move to make sometimes, particularly because this is a high speed S's through here, leading onto the back straight. Funneling through that section of track. Remember, Johannes von Overbeck gathered up in that start line incident, wondering how he's doing. Jan? 
Well, Greg, I just had a chance to check in with G&W Motorsports. Of course, that's the entry for Johannes Van Overbeck. And amazingly, he said on the radio when that all broke out going into turn number one, when he got sandwiched with Greg Merrill, he made a choice. He was going straight for Greg's passenger door and veered the car off and put himself in the wall to try and protect his fellow driver. So we heard from Greg, and he told us that he was A-OK -okay and the car was damaged. But boy, now that we get the rest of the story, certainly that was some heads-up driving by Van Overbeck. Well, that squeeze play, and I mean, you could see Merrill coming across, and Van Overbeck, he had two options and chose the right one as we go on board with Derek Bell. And you know, Merrill said that they weren't going that fast. There, there was a lot of hard contact against that concrete wall, and they were going fast enough to do a lot of damage. On board now with David Farmer, who was involved in that turn one incident, right in front of him is the number 18 of Dan Eastman, and right in front of him is Justin Marks. Good battle and the scrap unfolding here. Farmer had a pretty good qualifying run, ended up in fifth, but of course that incident dropped him back just a little bit. Trying to get around the outside of Eastman, horsepower. Did Eastman give him room? He did. I don't know, it's hard to pull that off. I mean, to go around the outside, particularly in the break zone. But Daniel Eastman, he let him, he let him go. He left the door wide open, let him go. I wonder if there's any coincidence that Farmer's running almost the same look color-wise as uh, the ALMS Corvettes from the uh, factory team. And good battle here. Marks, oh, big move up along the outside of Bell. Boy, it's tough duty to go around the outside here. And Mike Culver right in front of them in the Porsche. So we got him almost, well, two abreast, a little blocking back action going on there. And again, we saw the advantage of the four-wheel drive Audi, particularly from the apexes. As you turn, you plant the power, all four wheels hook up, and just draw you away maybe half a car length to maintain the advantage. Now chasing Michael Culver. Bell was able to, with the help of Culver, as I said, as sort of a blocking back, fend off the attack of Marks. But Marks looking very, very racy indeed. Boy, Culver a little wide of the apex there, but makes it work. So it's Culver, then the Audi of Bell, then that Porsche. So we go on board with Bell right behind him, the yellow vet of Farmer. Here we go. Bell looked like he had a good run out of the turn. But Farmer drops the hammer. And Petey Cunningham, as we move back to the front, has gone around McMillan and has picked up third. And he's all over the back of McClure. And McClure a little wide. Cunningham oh. ducks down to the inside. Phil McClure made it easy. You just drift too wide. And once you make a mistake like that, someone like a Petey Cunningham just absolutely rockets down the inside. You cannot make mistakes and open the door for someone like Peter Cunningham. He will kill you every time. Oh, McClure trying to come back on Cunningham. Side by each here into this first turn, and Cunningham has enough room. I'll tell you, McClure gave him plenty of room. Then it's McMillan, then that's Celine of Young, but notice how far the gap is out to Galati. Here. And if you look closely, you can see the damage on the left rear corner of Peter Cunningham's car, where he got walloped by David Farmer going into that very first turn. You wonder if uh, McClure's little bobble down in turn 17 wasn't a look in the mirror and missed the turn in. We'll be back. This Speed Channel presentation brought to you by Mazda. Introducing the 200 horsepower Mazda MPV. Body of a minivan, soul of a sports car. Okay, Speed Channel, I'm trying to work on this number 14 guy. He's driving very well, but he's a tad slow into the corners, which allows me to run up his bum, but I can't make the most of it. Here we go. But you see, I just can't do anything about him. Get onto this straight away, and he's gone. Do absolutely nothing about him at all. Listen to how her hard Bell is working here as he's chasing Culver. Absolutely. It is very warm here, but these cars are not easy to drive. They are physically difficult to drive, and Derek Bell out of breath trying to keep up with Michael Culver. There's the gaggle right there. A huge gaggle. Marks looked like he got a little squirrely trying to deal with some of the others in that gaggle, as you put it. And let's not forget, one, it's very hot here. Oh, look at and this. And Marks are on the outside of Bell. So now Mark's going to take up the attack on Culver, but it's hot here. And these are all front engine cars, except for the Porsches. So there's got to be some heat building up in those driver's compartments, just along with the ambient temps, which are brutal. Exactly. That was a good move by Justin Marks. Now, he tried that earlier, couldn't pull it off. 
Derek Bell pulled to the middle of the road, made it hard for him. Uh, Marks was going to have to go around the outside to pull that move off, which he did. Now, can he run down Michael Culver and can he get past him? Culver, an interesting story. You talked about the fact that he bought the uh, Skip Barber School organization and apparently he pays attention in class. He is doing Absolutely. a great job. Yeah, came from a single-seater background. Uh, he's listed as a rookie, but he has raced in the World Challenge in the past. BMWs, I believe. On board here with David Farmer, who has dropped just a little bit of drift of that fight up front. It's been so intense. I think that they're just actually pushing everybody a little bit faster, and Farmer's fallen back just a little bit. A lot of horsepower, thus a little bit more weight in that big vet. Hard on the brakes down to the turn. Meanwhile, there's the margin. Glotti, oh, then Cunningham, look what's now, and though. Young starting to close up on this. Let's check in once again with Derek. Okay, sweet channel. Just going by halfway through the race. Having a headache of a job to get by this guy in front of me. Now they're working each other over, which gives me a bit of a chance. But you can see the push I've got on with my car. I'll have to push myself so hard that I'm beginning to destroy the tires. Now he's taking a look down the inside. I'll have to do the same. You see, I just can't live with the power of that Porsche on the straight. So therefore, I find it very difficult to get that close. Keep at it, Derek. Look at the power of that thing. I can do it. I just can't get alongside him. Well, he mentioned a push. One, is that inherent in a four-wheel drive car? And two, that may be hurting him in terms of exit speed out of the corners to stay with him. Yeah, and remember, he mentioned earlier on he's faster into the corner than Michael Culver, the number 14 Porsche here. But exiting, he's not able to stay close enough. Therefore, he's not close enough to get past him on the way into the next corner. But he's out of breath. He's working hard as our D. <laughs> he sure is. No, and he's producing a great battle here, even though Marks has gone by, still trying to get by Culver. And you'll notice that Farmer now has closed right back up on this battle, back on board that low angle cam of Derek Bell. This is as close as he's been to Culver. Oh, and go for the go. move down the inside. On See board. if he makes it work, drifts out, and does. And Michael Culver's car looks brand new. There's not a mark on it, nicely painted, nicely presented. I'm not sure that he'd go into a banging session with D. Bell if he stuck his nose down the inside. Well, and it all came down to Derek being close enough to execute that move. There, then is Marks, then Bell, then Culver. Now Farmer is going to take up the attack on Culver here. And uh, they head down now, this last turn onto the long Ullman straight. But Derek now has a little bit different view in front. Derek? Well, sweet channel. Thanks for the booth. I've got a little bit of a break on the back straight here. Get a bit of a breather. Try and get some decent lap times in now. Trying to go quite quickly. Down we go. Down to third gear. To the last turn. One of those really tricky turns. Get on out. Out of fourth gear. And away we go. Well, you watch Culver close up going into 17, but drifted wide. Bell accelerates away. So he solidifies his hold on position in front. Next will be Justin Marks. We'll be back to Sebring right after this. Well, Speed Channel viewers, you notice I can catch a wee little bit on the corners. Then the power of that little Porsche just pulls away from me. Try to catch up a bit under braking. A bit under braking here. Go to the turn on the power now. And away we come out of the turn. We can't do much about him in front, which is a great pity. We're doing some pretty lousy times too. Never mind, let's persevere. Concentrate for a minute. Persevere. Yes, I want to measure Derek Bell's heart rate <laughs> right now. I guarantee you it is above 150 beats per minute. Such is the physical effort to drive in the heat of the day and inside in a closed car like this. And it's flat out. I mean, this is sprint racing at its very best. This uh, Speed GT action as we ride on board with David Farmer sits in ninth right now, chasing eighth, and that's the 14 of Culver right in front. And uh, it is absolutely pedal to it the entire race. No brakes at all. Culver and Farmer, that battle has uh, been a very, very good one here since Bell got by Culver. Meanwhile, there's Marks, there's Bell, and look at Farmer now. Well, tried to get a little something to happen here. This is where you'd think he'd have it if he could get a good launch out of this turn yeah. onto the Ullman Strait. It is a 911 Cup car versus the 
Corvette the V8 versus the Porsche engine here. There's not much to choose between these cars down the street. Even with the Audi, it's only entering the corner from about here to the apex where Derek Bell felt he was a tiny bit quicker than Michael Culver. But down the straight, these boys are fairly evenly matched. Look at this battle up front. That's McClure in third, McMillan and Young. I mean, there's the blanket can cover those three. You see Cunningham, a little brake light flash a little bit further up. McClure has been settled in this position for a little bit, but Young now pushing McMillan, and that's driving McMillan ever closer to McClure. And I'll tell you, that Mustang makes some unbelievable power, so you know that that Corvette, uh, not exactly lacking in power on its own, and McMillan with some great handling. This has just been an absolutely great drive here. And Young, he just not getting enough room to let that power start to scream. And make no mistake about it, this is a power racing circus. Let's check back in once again with a hard-working Derek Bell. Well, thanks for the boost. We're pushing away here. We're lying six position alone. Trying to get on this Porsche, but I'm not doing a very good job. I must concentrate on braking before I lock it all up. Be back to you in a moment. This is good. I, I it's very this. good. Yeah. It's very good. And obviously, it's it's difficult to chat your way around a course when you're driving at 10 or 11 tenths. And that's the issue. There's Culver. And he's actually opening up a little bit over Farmer. Yeah, nice little gap here now. Whether Farmer made a mistake or not, or whether Michael just got it together. But up back over the leader, Michael Gladdy, all by his lonesome Sweeney Todd here. He can see P.D. Cunningham coming up slowly. Cunningham, in fact, has set fastest lap of the race in his chase of Michael Galati, but they are so far ahead of the whole field. It's these two boys and then everybody else. Well, they've obviously solved their fuel management problem. That's what kept Petey off track. Even in his interview earlier, you heard him say not a lot of laps, and they were really chasing that. And to give everybody else another headache, uh, P.D. Cunningham has a second NSX ready to run at his shop, which may appear later on in the season. You see John Young. Boy, I'll tell you, Young Bigas, he's having a great run. Well, if you're looking for a rookie standout, certainly John Young is cutting the mustard today out of California. Now, the story with that Saline Mustang is that he raced that car here last year, then didn't race it again, spent the whole entire year perfecting that car, rebuilding it to find more speed. Well, I think that that work paid off as he is definitely on fire today, an aggressive rookie out of Woodside, California. That's the contract metal product, Celine, and he was fastest in the opening practice session. He was quickest, and I'll tell you what, I don't know what it is, whether it's the, uh, the development of the cars or some circuit improvements, but I mean, Galati was on pole by two seconds quicker than the old record. Everybody going extremely quick relative to previous years. Look at Young showing the nose on McMillan. Nope. One of the great things for John Young here is the car is obviously well sorted. He likes this car, but Miles maketh the man. Running in the company that he's running in right now, lap after lap, that is the best thing to give him the type of experience, develop the car another little bit, and he's pretty close to being a front runner here. He's right there. Of course, McMillan, a former champion, and McClure, a perennial front runner in this category. The problem is, that's for third. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sebring. There's your lead duo, Galati, then Cunningham. Things reversed a little bit from last year when it was such a close battle at the front, but this makes up for it. This is our battle for third, and it has been like this the entire race thus far, Derek. I mean, just this close. Young watching, hoping, wishing for some sort of mistake from McClure or McMillan. Not happening. Yeah, this is a good run here, McMillan. He doesn't normally take chances. But look at this, he squeezes down the inside, but McMillan, one of the most controlled drivers, former champion, doesn't really bang off people, but that was a good move there. And look at John Young, sees the move, and he tries to make one. He's going around the outside, or attempting to, McClure gonna fade over and sort of shut the door on him. McMillan made that look easy, was close enough to use those BMW brakes and just rock it on by. So now he's third, McClure is fourth, and Young is fifth right now. Here's the battle for 10th. That's uh, 18 Eastman and George Biscup. Remember him from a couple years ago? We talked about back this year, full season program, but apparently a problem with a tire. Uh, after qualifying, he started almost dead last. Yeah, in qualifying, he ran over some debris, destroyed a tire, had to put a new tire on, and the regulations say if you change tires, you have to go to the back of the grid. McClure right there, middle of the track. I think he's defending a little early on Young. Thought he'd be a little bit closer. Young right here trying to get a run built up. 
and down onto the front straight. Now behind him, we go on board with Derek Bell. And Derek, we've been talking about the temperatures. Certainly they're hot outside. How about inside? Well, everybody, as you can imagine, it's about 85 degrees, 90 degrees outside. And it's probably about 150 in the car. It's very hot. But as you know, it's only meant to be a 50 minute race. So of course, very few of us wear cool suits. We'd use them in the 12 hour, but not in this race. So constantly we uh, get plenty of air coming in, but it ain't any cold air today. Some guys do have cool suits. I don't, not as vital. Over to you. Thanks, and obviously this is like uh, doing a monster workout in a sauna. And, and remember now, he's got fireproof overalls on, so he's got two layers of underwear, and then he's got a three layers of a suit. That's five layers, which doesn't breathe very well because it's fireproof, so it's a hostile environment for a driver to be in. And then, of course, he puts a helmet on and a balaclava, which is the worst thing you can do because you can't breathe in cool, fresh oxygen to cool your body. So it is a workout for these boys. Big time, and there's McMillan, a little bit crossed up right there. Especially for the old boys. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was Daly, Derek. That was Daly that said that. I'll tell you, McMillan is now, he's on knife edge. I've watched him a couple of times. He's throwing that BMW around just a little bit, and uh, either that or it's just starting to go off on him and to carry the speed. He's got to uh, carry it as a little bit loose condition here. McClure right there and Young still trying to figure out a way to unlock this duo in front of him. You know, that car, the BMW, the red BMW of Jeff McMillan, just a gorgeous car. Isn't it? Just so well presented, so well prepared. Uh, I mean, it just, that, that, that is the class of the field in preparation with Jeff McMillan's car. Mind That's you, the Audi boys wouldn't agree with that. No, they'd, they'd have something to say, but uh, let's just say it's all top notch. I mean, if you're running at the front in... Uh, speed GT competition. It's got to be. It's got to be well prepped and turned out. That was first and second. Now you can see the margin back to McMillan in third, who now has opened it up a little bit over McClure, who's got Young all over him. This is a classic case of certain parts of the track favor one car, then you get to another section of track and the other car comes on. McClure keeps cheating into that turn just a little bit. Yeah. Is that maybe he's got a push developing? He's just trying to get it down to the apex? I don't know, but when John Young puts all of his horsepower through those rear tires, he tends to break away into oversteer. Just saw it right there. But you know, you mentioned about the, uh, the cars having an advantage. On the straight might be the place where they're more even than anything else. As this race goes on, it still looks as if it's on the straights that they're more equal. There's, look at oh, Young. Down the outside, difficult move, difficult move to pull off. Well, we've seen McClure turn in early. Now Young looks like he just tried to cut back underneath, but as you said, went to the throttle, the back end stepped out, and it sort of killed his momentum just a little bit. But he's trying everything, and this is as close as he's been. Here's the move. He looks. Oh, there's he's some smoke. There's some smoke fending out of that passenger side. He dives down to the inside of McClure, smoker steam. You know what, he's, he's still trying to push it here to get past Phil McClure, but it did look like steam or something coming out of that Mustang. Down the, oh, and he wiggled and almost got into the side of McClure as he bobbled under braking a little bit. That's I as think, close as I it think gets. Phil McClure knew he was down there, because Phil did not close the door and chop down, otherwise there would have been contact there. I think he left him room, that was good. What? There it is again, you see it? It's right yeah. out of the right passenger side. Something is venting out the side of that. Yeah, he's got to be real careful here. You got to be very careful. There's something overheating in that Mustang as again, as he drifts sideways under power. It's good he's being careful. We'll be right back to see where. We are back at Sebring and look in the background. There's Young once again, trying to do something with McClure. Taking yeah. it easy. Yeah, being real gentle Not here. Sure. Now he dives to the inside. He took McClure out high, trying to get squeezed down anything. Well, I'm going to tell you, he is just, I, I, I have to admit, I'm pretty impressed with Young's patient because there's a couple of times here where he could have gotten a little uh, chrome horn and nerfed a little bit, and he hasn't done it. And this is a great fight here because they are both so clean. Nobody has hit anybody. They've gone down the inside, uh, disputed their lines, and still stay on the road. Of course, behind this battle rages another one with Derek Bell. Derek, how's it going? Three laps to go. Just made a cock up at the last lot when I missed the gear. I have been having trouble all weekend with this gearbox and uh, had a lot of trouble in qualifying and uh, could do nothing about it. The guys are trying to work on it, but it just seems to lose its solidness and I just don't seem to be able to get on it and get it nice and square in the box. It's really difficult. Back to you. 
Thanks, Derek. And obviously that's had an adverse effect on his battle. And suddenly we come back to this battle for fourth, essentially, with McClure and Young. And Young is suddenly well back. Boy, a little big loose. You know what? There's something gone bat wrong with the back end of that Celine Mustang. It's loose now. Maybe the tires are gone off it. Maybe the steam we saw I was gonna say, has something yeah. to do with it. The way it was venting out there, if that's getting uh, underneath the car and under the tires, maybe that's the problem. Meanwhile, Galati, you know, in this kind of heat, it's never easy. And you can see in the background, this is an active airport off to the side. But Galati has had as, an easy time of yep. it as, as you could, I think, under, under the circumstances. The Italian who came to this country in 1980 and has, from since then, has made a habit of winning championships. He has won so many championships. And actually, did he get a test in the in the prototype? Audi he was R8? supposed to. We have to follow up on that and find out if he did, and if he did, how it went. That'd be very intrigued to know that as well. Yeah, Galati, of course, uh, a number of SEC national championships at the runoffs. Then when he got into this form of racing, three speed touring car championships, and he adds to that a fourth one last year in Speed GT. We get the report apparently about two laps to go, and there's your margin. Galati back to Cunningham, then a couple lap cars, and then we're watching for McMillan in third. And Peter Cunningham just could not make up the deficit from that incident at turn one when he did a 360, dropped back. He came on fairly quickly, but then the gap stayed fairly stable as we watch a battle for 10th place here. Tim Weens right in front, and then Biscop right behind him. Boy, I'll tell you, Biscop has had a great, great race coming from well deep, dead last, now knocking on the door of the top 10. But first, he's got to get by Tim Weens, the young rookie in the Weens Racing Porsche 911 Cup machine. And to explain that, the Cup car, that's the category of, of Porsche that they race in the, the uh, Porsche Cup championships in Europe that also runs in support of the Formula One race here in, at Indianapolis. It's different than the GT3 RS that races in endurance racing uh, fairly significantly. Still the battle here for a tenth. Biscop has made up a lot of ground. We followed him as he came through from that back of the grid. Not many laps, uh, laps left yet, though, to stay in that top ten. Be interesting to have seen what George could have done had he had the opportunity to start from his qualified position. He qualified 14th in a brand new car, brand new program after a year off, doing a nice job. But uh, yeah, two years off actually. So he. Um, he was the Rookie of the Year in 99 and then uh, just backed out of things for a little bit, but is back for a full season run. And he's probably still shaking rust off. Trying to get himself in the top 10 and not very many laps left to do it as you see the leader just drift through those S's. Mike Galati is just an immense talent and uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, would I would really be intrigued to find out how he did in the if he got the test in the R8 because I think he very well could have surprised and we anticipate he comes through Sunset Bend one more time here that uh, he should be looking at the white flag. And Cunningham has actually closed it up a little bit. Four wins last year. But Cunningham knows unless he makes a mistake, unless Galati makes a mistake, he is not going to win with this NSX today. Derek Bell has continued to fight the good fight. Derek, we're closing in on the end of this one. Just over that to go. I was making a bit of inroads on the four shiver. Hit this straight away. Off they go again. But I have got a bit closer. Mind you, he could also be taking it easier. Over, back to you. And you just saw fair evidence right there why they call this Sunset Bend. And it's late in the day and the sun gets low and this guy Derek gets blinding. It is and very, very bumpy on the right side, right tucked against the wall at the apex. It's the faster line, but you really have to manhandle the car and, and, and go over that rough terrain. Coming up to pick up the white flag, that was Derek Bell. Meanwhile, here's our leaders. And here's uh, P.D. Cunningham. Look at that, he's got his hand out the window. I don't know if he's waving or if he's just, he's uh, pretty much conceded the win. He's got second, and he may be just trying to cool off a little bit there, getting his hand out the window. That's very strange. Yeah. Hopes to have a teammate in a sister NSX later on this season. The car, which is probably valued about $200,000 to build it, is sitting in his shop right now waiting for a uh, new driver. Boy, what a that would be an awfully powerful team. And of course, 
This car, we know on certain tracks, is absolute magic. As a matter of fact, the next round of the championship at Mosport, Petey has said that he has never driven a car at that track that works like the NSX, whether it was a few years back when it was running non-supercharged or certainly now. See so John Young be dropping yeah. back. John Young gave up the chase now against Phil McClure as we watch Michael Galassi here. You've got to believe that Young's temps were, the needles are starting to go to the wrong end of those dials in a big hurry. The way that was, uh, it sure looked like steam the way it was coming out here. One long straight to go for Michael Galassi. He's had it, had, has had it, I can almost say it, his own way this, uh, this afternoon. But remember, Cunningham still did set fastest lap of the race. So if he didn't spin in that first corner, we might have had a real battle on our hands here. I was going to say, Galadia took advantage of it. He got a gift, but then he took well advantage of it and made his escape. Last time into Sunset Bend, long arcing turn, tightens up right about here. And he's found a line that, well, right there's a little bit of a bump, but he's found a nice smooth line, of course, with a margin like that. He could go ahead and drive it onto the front straight. Checkered flag is waving, and Mike Galati. The series champion from last year starts the defense off as well as you can with a win from pole. There's Cunningham second. You just saw McMillan in third. Yeah, Jeff McMillan, you know, wasn't that far behind those oh, boys. He, he reeled up. them in. So nice job by McMillan. McClure hangs on for fourth. And the young rookie, Young, doing a nice job in the top five. We'll be back. With a very excited Michael Glade. Hey, you had said the beginning, you forecasted it would be a very tough battle, but it didn't appear to be a tough battle. It looked like you had this race pretty well in hand. I don't think so. I mean, I saw Peter was coming. I had to keep my foot down. I think if it was right behind me, it would have been a close race than look. Was it a case today with the hot track temperatures that you really had to look after your tires and be smooth? I mean, we started getting locking up brakes, and uh, so I had to work my way out. I really did. Well, congratulations. Great way to start the season. Thank you. Thanks. Great way indeed. Let's take a look at the results. Galati with the win, Cunningham second, then McMillan, then McClure, and again, a great young job by Young. Marks, Bell, Culver, and Farmer, and Biscup rounding out the top ten, and I can't say enough about George's drive after two years off. Very good coming from the back. Great experience. I bet he enjoyed it. By the way, we got an update here that Mr. Galati did get his test in the R8 and that uh, he had three whole laps, but according to D-Bell, he was going very fast. And for next week, we're, we're going to put D-Bell on a treadmill to get him fitter. All right, let's go back down to Jan Vigas and a second-place finisher. Peter, earlier today it was the third step of the podium. Now it's the second. You're making progress. Didn't have anything for the Audi when it came down to the final few laps? No, not really. I think Michael was just... Uh, making sure he kept the gap. Isn't there one more race after this, though? Because then maybe I can... Yeah, you'll be looking good. Well, maybe there isn't. We'll have to wait till most sport. But no, the NSX worked great. Andrew Armistead in real time, you know, just prepare an awesome car. Hats off to the Audi guys. Michael Galati drove a good race. I had a little problem there at the start. Got hit from behind in the first corner. Managed to continue without any problems, though. So maybe next time. Well, he said he was worried about you. He said that he saw you coming and that he really had to put a concerted effort forward. So you were putting pressure on him, although it maybe didn't appear like it here from Pit Road. Well, I definitely was. I was banging off some fast laps, but uh, he just kept going faster when I went faster. So I figured I better uh, make sure that I keep my tires underneath me, which I did. But it's still a great day to start out the year with a second place finish here. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thanks, John. The consummate professional, P.D. Cunningham. Let's take a look at the points once again. Finishing order in this first race defines the top ten. Championship points, Ogilotti has that margin now. Of course, he got the bonus point for pole, etc. And we're also going to take a look now at our rookie points top five. And John Young, that great performance in fifth, puts him atop the leaderboard there. Then Culver, Weens, Wicked, and Brad Flowers with that 15th place finish gets us in fifth. Jeff McMillan, another podium. Let's go down to Jan Bigas. Well, Jeff, starting six today, ending up on the podium. Great start to the season. Pretty hairy out there for a while. Yeah, it was a, it was a perfect start for the season. Uh, I got a really good launch at the start. The Mustang in front of me kind of sat there and a couple other cars, and I just shot up through there somewhere around fourth place, and then somebody got into PD and won there, and that was close for me. I finally kind of waited to see where they were going and then just ducked inside and on we go. I don't know if Petey could come out of it as unscathed like he did because it looked like he was going into the wall last I saw. 
Next race in the championship, Derek, Mosport. Very different track. Yes, and I do look forward to hopefully seeing John Young continue for the season long because I was impressed with what we saw from him today. And don't forget the Acura Bad Fast at Mosport should be interesting. Thanks for joining us here at Sebring. We'll see you for round two at Mosport.